The Chris Evans Breakfast Show with Sky. Big fan of Strictly. Listen, uh, this is really the reason I wanted to come and talk to you this morning because I heard that you were maybe going to be on it, and I thought and you this, wanted um, to get you tickets. Well, I, well, not even that. I just I, actually, honestly, I just think that's a match made in heaven because on my sabbatical, one of the many things I've done on my sabbatical, maybe the most important thing I've done on my sabbatical is I've realised how important Strictly Come Dancing is, not only for the British public, but for me as an individual. Um, it's my favourite new pastime to sit and get overly invested in whether Stacey Dooley is going to win or not. Did you think she would? I, 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 assu- I assumed she would. We all thought would. that, didn't we? Mm. I yeah. hoped she would. Dooley! Um, and I, I was just, you know, and I was very, very happy to see it happen. But then when I heard that you were doing it, I thought, well, well that's, um, that's, you have to give the people what they, what they want. And that is what, the, <laughs> that is what everyone in this country wants. Yep. Breathing. Yeah. To start the day, and ladies, I'd like you to join in as well. I'd like the whole nation to join in. This is an exercise <laughs> invented by Sir Donald Sindon to remind us that vowels are for volume and consonants are for clarity. One comes from the larynx, the other from the actual <laughs> mouth itself, the teeth and the tongue. Are we ready? Yes. I will say the words and then you'll repeat them after. Okay. This is the mantra. All right. Hip bath, hip bath, lavatory, lavatory, bidet, bidet, douche. Okay? I'd like the whole nation now to do this. On the count of three. One, two, three. Hip bath, hip bath, lavatory, lavatory, b day, b day, douche. Kerry, Go- Kerry Godleyman in Afterlife. It's Ricky's, Ricky Gervais's new creation. Um, just explain to people what it's about. Please. It's about Ricky plays a guy called Tony whose wife has died and I play his wife and you know that I'm not around anymore from the opening scene because I, um, I'm in hospital having cancer treatment and I direct a camera say, if you're watching this, Tony, I'm not here anymore. And it's just about his grief and his depression and despair and he sort of goes down and turns his anger on the world. And and yet the people around him kind of a they teach him how to heal and love again and it's it's sad it's sad it's hilariously funny because he's decided he's got no holes barred he's just going to tell people what he thinks of them which is where a lot of the humour is um, it's very affecting it really seems to have got under people's skin and it's created this whole new thing where people are laughing and crying at the same yeah. time their faces are doing two seemingly conflicting emotions at the same time which is sort of amazing we have this lovely young girl who worked for us and she called me one day at the studio and she's, she said Jason there's a brown snake in the garden I went why are you telling me you're, you're meant to be looking after wife and kids she went yeah, but it's a brown. I went, I don't know what that is. I'm English. What type of snake is? No, a brown is a type of snake. It's the second most poisonous snake in the world. I said, well, what, what do I do? She went, I've killed it. I've put it in a pot outside the back door and you should take it in because it shouldn't be in a residential area. So I come home late at night and I look in the pot and there's this tiny little thing like a giant worm and I thought, all right, it's poisonous. And I went to pick it up with a pair of chopsticks and put it in the container and it went... <laughs> and I jumped about ten foot, and I I stamped on it a thousand times till it was literally just froth. That was oh all that was left. And I phone, I went inside, I phoned her, out, I went, Laurie, for Christ's sake, if they were still alive. She went, oh, I must have just stunned it. <laughs> It's totally casual. <laughs> and that's Australia for yeah. you. The OA Part 2 premieres March 22 on Netflix. But you, it's it a would... mystical, spiritual yes. thriller. Okay. It crosses every genre. Uh, There's nothing like it ever been made mm-hmm. on television before. It premiered on Netflix in December 2016 without any trailing, any promotion whatsoever. It dropped suddenly, literally, uh, from up above without any warning and zero I'll marketing. I'll tell you what happened on Netflix as well, because they, they had a marketing campaign. I remember seeing it. It was all around, you know, the initial premise, which I, was a blind girl who was snatched when uh, came back seven years later. She can see, but she won't tell anyone what happened to her. But she gathers a bunch of misfits. She starts telling this story. Is it true? Is it not? It's about travelling dimensions. It's kind of magical, and from there it all unfolds. But they had this campaign, and they dropped it, and they just posted it, and it began to build and build and build around the world. Because it's... I tell you what, the two indie filmmakers who had never done anything of any kind of scale wrote these these scripts on spec. They spent two years researching and writing this insane journey, and they went round and there was a bidding war. Now most things that get made, you sell an idea that gets developed, and they all got the same fingerprints on them. And they're sold generally. It's a cross between this and this, you know, to Inspector Morse meets Schindler's List or whatever the hell, you know, something. But this was not like anything anyone had ever seen. They thought let's just put it up there and let people find it. And they did find it in insane numbers around the world. It is one of the most binge series on Netflix, by which I mean people, when they start watching it, very, very often watch all eight hours in one go and call in sick the next day. <laughs> is it ever enough? Oh, when you ask me to leave and I fall to my knees and I'm begging you, please, what more can I do? No one ever sees this side of But it's still true All these foolish 
foolish things you do when you ask me to leave and I fall to my knees and I'm begging you please what more can I Tell us about your sea legs, because you did have to film a lot uh, out at sea. Now, I've been sea fishing, and I didn't have a fantastic experience, I have to say. <laughs> Watching the movie again last <laughs> night, it was the second time I've seen it, and it is very rocky out there. And the weird thing with me, I think they gave us a choice to have seasick tablets or not. Some people took them. I don't think I did. It hit me in the pub two hours later right. that day. But having said that... There was a focus pull on it. I now know the term when someone turns green. Mm. He literally was spewing up all over the side of the boat, as was the focus puller, but somehow we managed to get through well, it. Well, the issue for the cameraman, because I've done this in, 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 in the air, I've done it at sea as well with cameramen, yeah. Because, yeah. because they're looking through a lens. Yes. And so, so the tricks that the sea will play on your tummy if you have motion sickness via the naked eye is one thing. But if you're looking through an artificial device then it's entirely another, and it's yeah, magnified yeah. by like a thousand times. Those guys deserve medals. They do. <laughs> they really do. Our DOP certainly deserved the medal because it was it was proper rocky out oh, there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And you have yeah. Matt today, uh, first ever greatest hits. Yes. How you feeling? Really excited, happy. I want, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what people think of it. I started making this record December before last, so yeah. it's good it's finally out, and I'm very pleased with how it sounds. How, do, how does one go about making an orchestral version of your, your hits, that, your bona fide hits that we all know and love anyhow? Yeah, well, it sort of started off as quite what I thought was a small idea and kept getting bigger and bigger because it turns out with an orchestra more is always more so there's always more things you can add in right. um, so it's 16 songs 16 singles wow. and they've all been reworked in various ways okay so a set, I mean, was it over one sort of session or? no no spread out over lots of sessions actually so um, Ed Harcourt produced the majority of it with um, additional stuff from David Arnold and it's all been arranged by a lovely friend of mine called Amy Langley who has done I think a brilliant really sensitive clever set of arrangements why don't you explain to everybody what, what it's about Maybe. All right. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Benjamin is about a young BAFTA award-winning filmmaker who hasn't made a film for seven years. He's about to launch his second film at the London Film Festival. He's terrified it's going to go wrong. It does go wrong. His main problem is he is a person who is seeking love from an audience because he's terrified of intimacy. I don't know if you can relate to that at any point in your past, Chris. No, it says... Well, of course can, yeah. But it says it's autobiographical. How autobiographical is it? Semi. I think I wrote it as a way of figuring out what's wrong with me in my 20s. Right. And I think I'm better now. Um, so he's kind of me before I had a lot of therapy and found a boyfriend. Yeah, there's Colin Morgan, who's this brilliant human being who is so effortless and wonderful. Danny, you did a play with him. I, I've acted with Colin on stage, Jerry Mojo. Fantastic actor. There you go. Fenix Brossard, who is beautiful and French and... Uh, oh, I was going to say, is the, French, is the French boy really French? Yes, of course. Right. I don't really trust actors Bien to do sir. accents. No, mm. I don't know why that is, but I sort of always feel like I'm, I'm scared I won't know if the accent isn't good. So I, I feel like people... <laughs> like when Colin came in to read for the role, he wanted to do it in the London accent. I said, I don't, I don't, just do it in your own voice. Then there's one less thing to worry about. And the whole film is about intimacy, so I didn't want there to be anything in between the audience and the characters. I'm very up. nervous. I always get nervous when I come here because, you know, you know, because of the... the our connection. Our, our connection. <laughs> we I worked for Chris what? Evans. Really? Oh, okay. As a child. <laughs> I, was, I pretended to be 18. I was actually 17 and I did work experience at Ginger Productions and it was the most thrilling moment of my life. All I did, I think, I was thinking I was just like putting things in boxes. But it was, it was an amazing two days. Wow. <laughs> was it only two days? I think it was just two days. And then I sneak myself into the TFI Friday audience. And when to shake your hand, as you remember when you did that walk into the thing, there's a terrible, uh, very embarrassing <laughs> clip on YouTube of me going to shake your hand yeah. and you ignore me. I did, well, <laughs> I suppose you can interpret it as ignoring you, but I, didn't do, I really didn't know. No, I had not. a TV show to do. I know. I <laughs> and it was live. Sure, sure, sure. The Chris Evans Breakfast Show with Sky.